Hi, this is Justin Coletti from Sonic Scoop. Today we are in Avatar Recording Studios, pretty legendary place here in New York City. And we're here with, uh, I think, I hope I don't flatter you too much, uh, a living legend, Joe Ciccarelli. He's been doing this stuff 30, 40 years at least, I think. No, I don't know if it's that much, but 30. it doesn't feel Ish. like that much at least. Yeah. Well, it doesn't sound like uh, that much either because the records that you're doing now, Spoon, White Stripes, Morrissey, My Morning Jacket, I mean, they sound extremely contemporary. And I feel like when you're doing stuff in the 80s, it felt extremely contemporary mm -hmm. at that time. The stuff you're doing in the 90s felt extremely contemporary at that time. And what you're doing now feels extremely contemporary to this time. So uh, let's just start off there. How do you adjust your approach over time to always feel like you're pushing things? Because I think you well, are. Well, I think, uh, you know, really you're making the artist's record. And as a producer, it's your job to understand the artist and trying to find out what they're trying to accomplish with that particular album and what makes them a great artist and you're trying to bring out their strengths so you're really kind of working for and with them so regardless of the time that it's done in and of course this is pop music or it's contemporary music we're a product of our times so you're of course influenced by the perhaps the dryness of 90s records or or the wetness of 80s records or whatever it is so you can't help but listen to the radio every day and be influenced by what you hear so those things kind of creep into whatever you're doing but i think you really are there to serve the artist that's always been my main focus is how can i get inside this person's head and try to help them bring out their vision. Sure. So in a way, the artists themselves are kind of keeping you fresh because you're trying to find out what's inside their head, what's inside them. Absolutely. You know, I've been lucky with my morning jacket and the white stripes and the shins and a number of artists where that, that chemistry, that understanding is there and it makes for a lot more fun in the studio and it's, uh, I think, a, a better record in the end. Totally. Yeah. So I've noticed that for a lot of projects that you work on, uh, you'll produce them, you'll create the kind of vision for it, but at the very end, you work with another mixing engineer. Why would you work with that? Absolutely. There, there's times where you're used to certain balances. You've heard the record in a certain light. And even though those balances might work and they're good, it's very hard for you to get away from them. So when somebody else comes in, I've found that they have a fresh outlook on it. And I'm like, you know, I know you're really in love with these guitar tracks here in the chorus, but you know what? To my ear, the hook of the chorus is that other guitar track that you're kind of burying. Sure. You know, those tracks that you, that little arpeggio part or whatever it is that you spent four hours on that you're right. in love with now, you got this cool sound, I would turn that down and I would favor these. To have somebody come in and offer you that perspective is a great, gift. So at times I, I will hire somebody when I feel like I need that objectivity. So in a way street. you get to kind of divide the labor where someone's taking more of a macro perspective exactly. and someone else is taking more of a micro perspective. Exactly. And dividing that can be useful, yeah? Yeah, I think that definitely one job of a producer, I mean, it's a very kind of crazy, almost schizophrenic job mm. in the sense that I'm constantly going back and forth mm. between worrying about the EQ, worrying about the detailed look, to then stepping back going, oh, is this the appropriate part? Does this make it not sound like the band? Is mm. this not credible anymore? So you're constantly going back in the way you listen to things to being this detail freak to stepping back and listening to it like a fan would yeah. listen to it and going, okay, I'm a fan of this band. Does this get me excited? Do I still believe in this band? Are they still cool? Right. Or did they sell out? You know? <laughs> so it, like you're you're yeah. you're doing that that back and forth thing in, in microseconds. There's two very different <clears throat> sets of questions to ask, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now I noticed that there are still some projects though that you will produce and mix. And of then occasionally you will mix stuff that other people send to you. Always, yeah. So is your process in mixing different depending on whether you've been with the project the whole time as opposed to when someone's bringing you a project to the end and say, help us finish um, this? Does it change? The difference is obviously that I'm not invested in it so much that I'm tied to certain ideas or concepts or even balances or sounds. 
when you come in fresh on somebody's project, I think you can almost be a little bit more carefree and, and try things that you might not try if it was something that you started from the get-go. I'll do the same process that I do with artists that I'm meeting with to produce. I'll really mm -hmm. talk to them about what they like about the rough mixes and what they don't like and what they want out of the record. And when you're not so precious about things that you've recorded, you know, sometimes you'll take forever to get a drum sound or whatever sound it is. And then the thought of just totally abandoning it and trying something else when you mix is, you know, well, oh, oh, I spent all day long getting that part and now I'm gonna like squeeze it down to this big of a sound. Right. Oh, no, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Well, either way, when you're mixing, mm -hmm. is there a way that you start? First of all, is there a way to set a foundation for a mix that works? How do you keep your perspective throughout the mix? And then finally, how do you know when you're done? Okay. I start by, if I'm in the box, out of the box, bringing up all the instruments. To me, it's not about the individual instrument. Mm -hmm. It's about how they relate to one another. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'm going to do is get a balance with all the instruments there. And then I'm going to see what's working and what's not working. What's perhaps competing with another instrument. Or guitars are fighting the piano or the synths are fighting the program percussion. I'm going to find those trouble spots and, and I'm going to experiment for a minute with maybe muting something or thinning something out or dulling it down to find a space in the mix for it. But I'm always working pretty much with everything in. And I'll take the vocals out for a while and build up the track. And sure. then, put the vocals back in and see if I've taken up too much room that the vocals need to have. Every singer is obviously different and different range and if there's a lot of background vocals mm -hmm. or not and it's going to take up certain frequencies so sometimes it's you know really fun you get your guitars nice and massive and then you put this vocal in and you're oh boy there's no room for the vocals so right. what do I do do I chill out the guitars do I tweak the vocal in a way that it just pops through enough and so to me it's a it's a very holistic approach to, uh, of putting everything there and making it all work together and I, I think that that sort of moment when you feel that you're you're there you're done I think it's when you know I, I always feel like it's a it's a journey it's a three and a half four minute journey it's a car drive right. and you have to kind of keep the listeners attention there all for those four minutes but sometimes you have to do it by creating little events and little transitions from verse to chorus or perhaps when the energy is low in a spot you're going to throw some delay on and it's almost like the the billboard on the highway that when you're getting white line fever there you're kind of like just numbed out there's a billboard here and all of a sudden your attention's mm. gained again so what you're doing on a mix is working towards that moment where you feel like the listener is captivated for those four minutes and you haven't lost them mm. and at the end of the four minutes you feel like you're satisfied you've been engaged so that's kind of the moment where it feels done where it feels complete yeah. to me i think that's a, a good metric to go by how do i feel when i've listened to the song from beginning to end because i think a lot of people when they first start is does my kick drum sound good enough only once i have it good enough then i'll be done and Ultimately, does that have anything to do with the impact of the song? I, mean, I, I don't think so. I think when I was first young and starting out, I, I think that, yeah, I would solo a kick drum or a snare drum for a day and try to get, you know, yeah. the ultimate whatever sound. Sure. And after a while, it just becomes that that's one piece of the puzzle. And sure. I'll solo things a lot when I'm mm -hmm. live tracking a band and I'll make sure things are clean or clear or whatever right. I'm looking, looking for, for problems. Moment. Yeah, exactly. But when I mix, I hardly ever use the solo button yeah. because it's all about how one thing relates to another. Yeah. No one gets a solo button when they listen to the song. True story. So it, it's 
just how those pieces of the puzzle fit together. Yeah. Uh, although, who knows, going forward, I think Nine Inch Nails released one of their albums as a multi-track, so don't, uh, don't say it too definitively no, yet. I know. But one, in general, absolutely. No, totally but what, right. you're absolutely right. One day we'll have some multi-channel format that will allow people to basically take music apart and put yeah. it back together again. Yeah. So all flaws will be revealed, yes. Right. Yeah. But uh, we were talking earlier about... That, that kind of eureka moment that you feel like, oh yeah, it's done, it's mm -hmm. there. And we're you know, in a wonderful analog studio here where everybody's mixing hands-on with automation yeah. and mixing in the box. For me, I don't quite get that same magic moment where you feel like, oh, it's done. And the song is delivered. The song right. is just some magical chemical reaction yeah. happened between all these sounds. I find that when I'm mixing in the box, you're tweaking your plugins, you're tweaking your balances, and at some point you kind of sit back and go, well, I have fixed everything I wanted to fix, <laughs> so I guess I'm done. All the boxes have been checked. It's much more meticulous in a way. Exactly. There's a little bit less of the kind of artistic performance mm -hmm. of you know, yes. working with one of these. Yeah. So many other uh, the rock records that you work on, I think you work with a lot of vocalists who are extremely expressive. You can really feel their dynamic. Like these are people who are letting loose and somehow you're helping to encourage them to let loose. But then in the end, their vocal sounds really dynamically controlled without you getting the sense of uh, over compression. How do you, first of all, get singers to let loose so much? And second, how do you, you know, get that feel of dynamics across while still controlling them so the dynamics of the vocal don't feel all over the place? It's tricky with singers because every single singer is different. Sure. And again, this goes back to having the, the, done the research and meeting with the artist and, and listening to their demo and listening to their past albums and thinking about their voice and thinking about what microphone would work well with them and what part of the character in their voice is the thing that attracts you to them, what makes their voice special, what's emotional about their voice, and is it all those high overtones on the top, or do they need a lot of warmth, and, or do they need a, a much more forward, aggressive mid-range to their voice? And that even changes from song to song within an album. So I'll try to find microphones while I'm tracking. Every song I do with them, I'll try out a new microphone while mm -hmm. they're out there with the band doing guide vocals. Usually I have in my mind, okay, he's gonna sound good on this type of microphone. But usually by the end of tracking 10 or 15 songs, you know that he sounds pretty good for the ballads on this mic, but the rockers, he sounds good on this one. And so when it's time to do the final vocals, you, number one, don't have to go searching for microphones. You have mm -hmm. a sense of, you know, what's working for that artist. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll use a lot of compression, mm -hmm. um, you know. Do you find it best to do that in multiple stages or are you unafraid to kind of drive one heart? Depends. A lot of sessions I've done lately, I'm in love with my Retro 176 sure. compressor and you can drive that pretty hard and not hear it, so I'll use that a lot. But many times I'll do two compressors and I'll set the attack and release very different and the mm -hmm. ratio is different on those two compressors and have them work together. In other words, when one compressor is releasing, the other is starting to compress. Ooh, so they'll kind of, maybe I'll do an 1176 and a distressor. and So the distressor is kind of catching the things that the 1176 didn't catch. Right. I mean, would you, in that context, often put a faster one before a slower one or the other way around? I usually put the slower one first. Interesting. Because okay. I, I like to get the character, if you will, from the first compressor. Mm. That's where I, I get the, the color. Sure. And then that second compressor might be there almost strictly for level in the sense that, okay, I've got a tone and character out of that first compressor, gotcha. but now I need to bring the vocal in my face a little more. Yeah. So I, I need to kind of compact it a little bit more so it's here in the mix. Interesting. So you get a little bit of that saturation and tone out of the first one, and then the second one is doing more of the control and yes. kind of tapping things. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 
when it comes to uh, compression on other instruments, people always like to ask about compression on drums. Are you uh, a parallel guy? Or what's your whole vibe there? I, I think everybody is these days, and it's something that somebody showed me early on in, in my career. I think that the only thing that's different about what I do parallel compression-wise now than I did 20 years ago is that there's probably a lot more parallel compressors. <laughs> and maybe in 1987, it was a Neve 33609. Yeah. And now it might be a Neve 33609 with a couple of distressors, with, <laughs> a, with a Chandler and with a API or whatever else. Sure. When you're making modern rock records now, people want the sensibility of a dance record. Mm. You know, in what way? Well, uh, that means to me, constant forward sounds, like you are when you're listening to program drums. Yeah. There may be some dynamics or no dynamics, but you're almost tricked into thinking that there's dynamics. Right. It's almost the arrangement becomes the dynamics rather than level changes. That's right. The density. That's right. Yeah. But when you're thinking about a live drummer, there's a lot of dynamics right. there. So. I think people expect rock records now to have that sense of every sound is the same, every hit is the same, every hit is the same dynamic. Yeah. Now, if you were to actually do that, it would sound really flat and boring. Sure. And so you have to find ways of, of keeping it alive and dynamic in the song. So one thing I'll do with those parallel compressors is that I'll ride them or I'll use different parallel compressors in different parts of the song. Sure. So maybe in the verse, I just have my Neve, but yeah. maybe when I need more power in the choruses, I turn on the Chandler, mm -hmm. or maybe in the bridge of the song when I want a different sound, I turn those two compressors off and I yeah. put on some old tube compressor that's panned mono. Yeah. And it has a different character. So now I've given you three different colors and three different dynamics through the course of the song. Do you think in general it's best for the mix to change section to section? Do you... uh, of course it depends on the song. Of it's course, all song yeah. driven. But yeah, I think you're definitely trying to create waves and trying to create an experience mm. and trying to keep that person listening. So if you do something that is so non-dynamic mm -hmm. that you kind of get bored and tune off to it, yeah. that's not gonna work. So you gotta create something that has that energy and that forward kind of uh, impact, sure. but keeps you engaged for of five minutes. And obviously there's some, if, you're, if you have a mix that is a, a singer and a guitar, you're not gonna do necessarily wildly <laughs> different no. uh, rides, but if maybe if you have more and more elements to work with, does that become the situation where you... Uh, oh, absolutely. I think, you know, the tricky thing is records that are just tons of tracks. And I'm sure you get a lot of those now. Yes, everybody wants to hear every element in, yeah. in seemingly an equal fashion, which is mm -hmm. impossible. Everything so you, should be the loudest at all times. At uh, all times, yes. And yeah. then, then you're gonna recall the mix and you're gonna get the two elements that you forgot to make loud enough yeah. louder. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about recall. I know you work on an analog console mm -hmm. and I know that the generation, I'm sorry, my generation, we expect uh, our DAWs to be like word processors and we open them up where we left off and can't we just continue working? And it doesn't quite work that way on one of these. What have been some of the most effective ways for you to deal with recalls in kind of a analog slash digital hybrid setup? The recall thing is the way we make records now. It's just something everybody expects. So if going into a project, if the artist isn't gonna attend and I know that I can't get immediate feedback on a mix, then I can't do it in the analog world. And maybe I might like the way this old console that I work on sounds, but I, I've got to kind of give that up because I know that the artist is on tour somewhere and needs to call in with changes two weeks later. Sure. So uh, even if I'm mixing on an analog console, I'm gonna print detailed individual stems. I'm not gonna print every single fader of that mm -hmm. console, but I'll maybe print 16, 20 tracks of stems that will give me enough flexibility that when somebody calls and wants the tambourine up louder yeah. in the third chorus, it can be done pretty easily. 
And now you're one of those mixers who actually prefers to have the client in there in the room with you if you can, right? Why is that? I love having the artist in the room with me um, when I'm mixing. I think there's a team that becomes mm -hmm. built in the session. I think when the artist is there and asks to address a problem or hears a sound in their head and when you can achieve it together and it's there and apparent over the speakers, they immediately get to go yes, no. And if they all of a sudden realize that it's not working, it's their decision to not go for that particular effect. And I find they're okay with it where if you're doing things by remote and somebody asks for a certain sound or direction and you're sort of not agreeing with it, mm. you've kind of got to go there and then you go through the thing of well, sending it to them and they're sort of like, uh, mm -hmm. gee, I know I asked you for that, but it's not really quite working. What if we tried something right. else? Right, so a process that could have been drawn out over minutes gets now drawn out over exactly. days or weeks. Exactly. I hear yeah. it. Yeah. So it can often, even with all the interconnectivity we have, it can sometimes still be more efficient to have two people in a room together. I, I firmly believe that. And I also believe mm -hmm. that when the artist is there, they take ownership of the mix. Mm -hmm. They're a part of it. They're there for every detail of it. And I never ask an artist to be in the room for eight hours or six hours right. of a mix. It's That's the, the worst thing they can do is you, you want objectivity. You want them to come in close to the end of the mix. Close and to the end. Fresh. That's what I was going to ask. So if you're going to have them at one side or the other, it's better to be close to the end rather than close to the beginning? Absolutely. Perhaps if it's a record that I haven't worked on, it's the first time I've heard the song, I may ask them to come in and sit with me and you know, ask them what they want out of it, what they feel is a problem, what they don't want to highlight too much. But most of the time, I'd rather start my day at 10 or 11 in the morning, work at it for a few hours, get something by 1 o'clock that I feel good about, have them come in at 3 o'clock, play it for them, make some changes, and you know, usually you're done by 5, 6 o'clock, and you move on to the next song. Gotcha. All right, well, thanks one more time to Joe Ciccarelli. Thank you to Avatar Recording Studios for having us. And thank you to B&H for sponsoring this shoot. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Go to sonicscoop.com. Go to bnh.com. Sign up for the newsletter there where you can find out about more great video interviews like this one as they come out. Thanks again for hanging out with us. See you next time. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.